What do you feel compelled, that you feel like you need to make a comment on something? Anybody feel compelled that there's a particular topic or subject that comes up? You go, oh, no, 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 We're not gonna, you're not going to get away with that. And then you jump into a comment section, whether it's on YouTube or wherever it is, and you feel like you need to have, share your opinion. There's any particular topic that you have, maybe. Nobody comments on anything. Nobody says anything. Yes? Vaccinations. Vaccinations, okay. Okay. Apologetics, possibly? Yeah, there's a lot of them in that, but that is definitely one that you have to be very cautious of. Yeah. Buddy, you better, you, when, you wade in, when you wade into those waters, that could be a six-hour discussion you weren't asking for. It could be more of a stumbling block than a... Yeah. Uh, that's right. Absolutely. It could suck your time up where you're just, you know, whistling in the wind there. You're just fighting the wind at that point because everybody's got to have an opinion. If, I, if something is absolutely... What? Oh. Awesome, or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Any topics? Like for me, it was it was probably when somebody has a, a hot take on a movie that I know is bad, I feel compelled to say, you're wrong. <laughs> you're clearly wrong. Yes. Rise of Skywalker. You're wrong. You're wrong. Uh, yeah. So I did. I gave up a lot of my fandoms for that very reason because I felt compelled to defend everything. These people, they make, make millions of dollars. I'm not making any of it, and I'm defending them to people that I don't care about their opinion as much, but I felt like I need to offer my opinion. And so when we get caught in those situations, and that, by the way, that's not just an online thing. There's things that people say in person, to your face, that you feel compelled to say something. So today I would like to talk about the discipline of restraint. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Otherwise known as self-control, but I like the word restraint better, right? James talks about, right, that we put bits in horses' mouths to be able to direct when it's talking about our tongue. And it's a, it's, a, it's a way of restraining the horse from doing what it wants to do. It is going to be under the guidance of Scripture or the Holy Spirit or, or whatever, your self-control, right? We don't just farm that out. We don't just say, oh, well, the Holy Spirit will take care of it, or the Bible will take care of it. No, no, no. We're, we're in control of that, a lot of what we say and do, right? Uh, so we have for this, we do have a very, uh, a very cool practice that I want to have for you that's going to teach you how to have a restrained conversation. Maybe it's a practice you can use even here in the house, or you do it in your youth group or your church or wherever that may be. Um, okay. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So, yeah, go ahead and just doodle this while it's not necessary. But if you'd like to doodle this, my encouragement would be is this. If you would like to just a, a quick practice while I'm talking. Uh, I'm not offended by doodlers and people who are just kind of doing whatever. I have kids every week that are looking at their phones. It doesn't bother me at all. But here's what I would challenge you to do with that particular verse, is I would somehow, and you don't have to be an artist, you know, stick figure, circle, right? This is your city. These are your walls. Your walls can be whatever they are. I would encourage you to find the breaches. Where are your walls falling down? Okay, once again. Hmm? Oh, we can't see it. Oh, it's, yes, it's just, a, it's just a circle with a man in the middle, a little stick figure. And so if that's the wall of the city, okay, I would encourage you just to take notes and just kind of whatever, just kind of as, a, as a, your own personal exercise, is find out where your breaches are. Find out where the walls are collapsing. If you remember Nehemiah, right, they're rebuilding the walls of the city. And some guys had, I mean, worship and work was the same. They had swords in their hands in one hand and a brick in the other. And you had to, they were going to defend that city. And sometimes, like I said, if you don't have self-control, if you don't have self-control, your city is getting robbed. Okay? You see all these people, you ever see these mass people, like 30 people go into a Walmart and steal everything in the place? Like it's this mob theft. That's a lot like what's not having self-control is if you don't have any boundaries, anybody can come in and anybody can go out, okay? There's reasons why houses have doors, right? 
It's to keep people out and keep certain things in. So you got to have those things. Okay? So let me talk about social boundaries. The Bible says, John 2, 23, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the signs he was doing and believed in his name, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them, for he knew them all. He did not need any testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. So, once again, he, he has control over who he... I'm not saying don't trust people. I'm saying don't entrust yourself to people, right? You have to have boundaries with certain people. Otherwise, they will run your life. They will be happy to take all your time. They will be happy to suck the life out of you and leave you drained on the floor. And then they'll go, oh, thank you for talking, and leave. And you're just a puddle on the ground going, I'm so tired. Do you know people like that? They're just exhausting. And if you don't have boundaries for, for people like that, you're, I, know, listen, I know a lot of you are empathetic. You have great amounts of empathy. But even in your empathy, you have to have boundaries. Even though you care so much, and you want to be helpful, and you want to be needed, and you want to be all those things, my encouragement is make sure you know, because Jesus said, look, I have social boundaries. I have things that I'm not entrusting myself to people because I know what's in them. I know what's in a man, okay? Sahar Andrade of Forbes magazine gives a few reasons why we lower, eliminate, or never build boundaries. Not being able to set healthy boundaries can be related to common issues like low self-esteem, needing approval from others, learned helplessness, fear of being rejected or criticized. So we don't build boundaries because we feel like if I, if I keep people out, I'll never be wanted, I'll never be, in, you know, I'll never be needed, or I'll never, um, you know, whatever. I've got to let everybody in and I've got to let everybody be a part of my life. Otherwise, I'll have nobody. Okay? Which then goes back to our aloneness and being content with, I don't have to fix everybody. I don't have to deal with everybody. I can just, I, it's okay, right? Can I get a picture of that real quick? Hmm? Can I get a picture Please, of that? go ahead. Thank you. And you can look up the article. If you look up the name in the article, there's a, the whole article's there. I, I kind of pick picked out of it what I thought would be of value for you guys. And then she goes on and says, she also says there's a few benefits of building boundaries. You effectively listen and see other points of view while still respecting your own. You practice self-respect by standing your ground. You avoid future conflicts and resentments. You set reasonable consequences for violating your own boundaries. Boundaries are important. Restraint is important. Building the wall, keeping the, once again, it's not necessarily to keep everybody out, but there's a door in the city, right? Most of these cities that you see in Jerusalem had a main entrance that you kind of got into, right? To protect the city. And they would check on you and they would check people coming in and out of the city, okay? So don't apologize for having boundaries because the benefits outweigh the consequences. It's okay to say, I'm not going with you guys. It's okay to say, I'm gonna stay here. It's okay to say, hey, I'm gonna do X and I'm gonna go do it by myself and don't be hurt or offended if I didn't ask you to go with me. Like I said, I enjoy my alone time. You should enjoy your alone time. If you want to go to the movies by yourself, go to the movies by yourself. It's not an indictment or a judgment on anybody else. You're just saying, look, these are my boundaries. This is what I'm doing. I'm not doing it to keep you out because you're a bad person. I'm kind of just like, hey, I need to take care of myself. Then there are spiritual boundaries. Guard your heart with all diligence, for, for, for from it flows springs of life, Proverbs 4.23. Set boundaries and then make them convictions. In other words, there's certain things you're not going to do, okay? You guard your heart with all diligence, for fl from it flows the springs of life. That means when our heart is in a bad place, and it does not have boundaries, and it, it can get out of control. The heart can get out of control if, we, if it does not have the boundaries there, okay? It doesn't have to be this all the time, okay? We don't have to say, you shall not pass, okay? We don't have to keep lock people out all the time and go, no, oh, stay over there. You don't have a boundary with you, okay? It's, it's just a, be friends, be loving, be kind, but you know what to do with your time. You know what to do with those things. You know if you're not spending the time, quality time that you need to have. By the way, if you can spend all, here's the thing. Sometimes you get so drained from somebody emotionally that it affects your time with the Lord because now you're having to re, you know, you're trying to gain back what you lost versus going into your time with the Lord in a different way that says, hey, 
you know, I'd rather have, you know, this kind of conversation. Instead, I find myself just completely drained. Boundaries are built over time, brick by brick, prayer by prayer, as you build your identity in Christ. Saying no and drawing lines becomes easier over time. Okay? No is one of the greatest words of all time, and I'll tell you why. Youth pastors, especially people-pleasing youth pastors, feel the necessity when they're younger, as I did, the necessity to say yes all the time. No boundaries. I would, you know, like if my family had a thing and the church asked me to do something, sometimes I would give up, give up a family thing to go do a church thing because I felt like I, I had no boundaries and I felt like I had to say yes. And so regardless of what position you're in, but if you do plan on being a pastor of any kind, you're going to have to learn to say no and say, that's not in my portfolio. That is not my deal. That's not my responsibility. Give that to somebody else, right? Right now I am paid part-time by my church. And there's things that I will not do for my church because they pay me part-time. If you would like my full attention, you will need to pay full price <laughs> because we will give ourselves away for less, which you shouldn't do. I have because I'm an idiot. So, uh, and I'm trying to teach you this so you yourselves will not do that, okay? Because ministry doesn't mean uh, you have to flog yourself and deplete yourself for God to do what he wants to do. You have to build those boundaries in your life, okay? Pro tip, everyone has the same amount of days and time. How you fill it is your choice because if you, everybody say you, you. say me, 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 do not fill your calendar, somebody else will. If you're waiting around for something to happen, something will, but it may not be the thing you want. So if you say, my schedule is X, if you're waiting around for just somebody to come, they'll, they'll, look, the they'll, they'll life is filled with emergencies that people would love to put on your calendar. There's people who are having a problem, an emergency. And if your calendar's not full, uh, if your calendar's not full, then you, you feel like, you, oh, well, sure, I'll come help you. I'm not doing anything. You have to direct and create those boundaries on your calendar. You have to create those boundaries and restraint in ministry. You have to do it in personal life. You have to do it. Sometimes you have to do it with your family. Amen? Sometimes you have to say, uh, listen, uh, Grandpa, it's a bit much. We're not talking about Trump today. Okay? We have boundaries. We're not talking about politics at the dinner table. We're not talking about X. There's certain things you say, we're just not going to talk about that. That's the boundaries. You set those, say, I will not engage. Okay? Even though that is hard for some of us. Self-control is innate and spirit-led. Now, what do I mean by innate? Anybody know that word? Hmm? In other words, it's given to us. It's innate. It is inward. It is something that we are given. For God gave us a spirit. Is that a capital S or a small s? Okay, what does that mean? It's not the Holy Spirit. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In other words, self-control is not a spiritual gift. It is something that God was able to give us to say, you have control over situations, right? It says properly, safe-minded, issuing in prudent or sensible behavior that fits a situation. Have you, have they, have you ever witnessed anybody do something that didn't read the room. <laughs> they didn't read the room. And they did something so inappropriate or said something so crazy. You're like, okay, right? God has given us the ability to discern moments and say, I probably shouldn't say that. I probably shouldn't do that. Now, we say and do things all the time we probably shouldn't say or do. But we have the ability. What I'm saying is that God has given us the ability to do so and should track with it okay next thing is this but the fruit of the spirit is that s capitalized or lower capital so but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law in the sphere of right dominion mastery properly dominion within in other words, the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is that He is able to help us control things that sometimes we feel not in control of. 
that the Holy Spirit can bring that extra effort where we are failing. Okay, proceeding out from oneself, but not by oneself. That's an important point. Proceeding out from within oneself, but not by oneself. In other words, have you ever done something that you felt like wasn't you, but felt like was the Holy Spirit? That you did not, you were not able to do a thing, but the Spirit made up for that? Yes? You've all had those, right? So that fruit of relationship you have with God, it comes out in times and moments when we are insufficient. When our, when our, when when we didn't read the room, the Holy Spirit remi reminds us of things. It's, uh, I probably don't want to do that. Don't know. Wait, 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 wait. Don't stop. Don't say that. Don't say it, right? So the Holy Spirit comes alongside of you and helps you. I'll tell you what, self-control, I believe, um, saved a man's life in my case. I had a pastor one time who was on the verge. He's firing me from his church um, because I did a big concert and I tore the stage apart for the band. This is an old school church in Panama City. And so he is screaming at me. I mean, I've never seen a pastor scream, but he screamed at me. Screaming at me. And I just remember the Holy Spirit just going, saying, uh, a gentle, what is it, a gentle, uh, turns, away wrath. turns away wrath. And so the Holy Spirit at that moment reminded me of that verse and saved that pastor's life from me. Because <laughs> it, was, it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. Sadly, that man would have to die that day. But he didn't, and God saved him. Amen. And uh, because if it's up to me, I'm going to destroy you. If it is up to God, he is going to save you. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in and says, I'm going to help you, remind you of a scripture, put an impression upon your heart, fill you with overwhelming love, whatever that is, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of the Spirit coming forth that we don't have control of, but comes forth in our life, right? For the believer... Self-control, spirit control can only be accomplished by the power of the Lord. Your time in the shadows allows the Holy Spirit to call out your immature behavior and transform immature reactions to mature responses. How many of you would consider yourself reactionary? In other words, you're reactionary. Somebody says something, you're like, bah! you automatically have a reaction to it. Versus, I would say that is that reaction is more of an immature quality because we've not thought it through. We didn't pause. We didn't take the moment. And instead, that time in the shadows, it turns, in other words, we come up with, our, we come up with responses. When somebody says this, I know I'm going to say that. When somebody does this, I know this is going to happen. Somebody's going to do that, Scripture compels me to do this. In other words, you have a preconditioned response you've come up with for those situations where you feel like you're going to be most reactionary. Amen? You guys agree with that? Okay, uh, you have to yell at everyone on the internet in all caps. I'm using restraint, okay? It's real simple. <laughs> okay, everybody on the internet, it's caps. I'm yelling at you, big words. People do that on Twitter and everywhere else. You say, I'm using restraint. In other words, I don't have to respond to everything. I like what Dave Chappelle says about Twitter. Twitter's not a real place. It's an imaginary world where people go into for whatever. And I think all internet spaces are not real because the things that people say on the internet are not things they would necessarily say in real life to real people. I don't. I, I mean, look, you, if you, somebody's bagging on, you know, The Rock, if you take that person and put them in front of The Rock and say, go ahead and say what you just said on Twitter, that person will be like, well, listen, what I was saying was the tone changes when you're in real life. When you're, when you're a keyboard warrior, right, and you're just clicking away, you think restraint isn't necessary. What are they going to do? Come to my house? Come and get me? Am I going to get banned? I think you have to know going in that restraint is part of the deal. I agree with Peter when he says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live in freedom, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Treat everyone with high regard. Treat everyone, everyone, even the idiots on the internet. Treat them with high regard. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Uh, Peter, by the way, reactionary. Reactionary person, right? This is Peter who draws swords and cuts off ears to defend Jesus. 
And we, oftentimes, as believers, do the same things. We are quick. Oh, no, we're not going to talk about Jesus like that. I will cut your ear off. Some, some people will like to do it physically. Most of the time, people want to do it spiritually. They want to, they want to jab you and say, here's a scripture, and they stick you with it, right? Because we want to defend Jesus, and Jesus is like, no, 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 we're going to put the ear on. What does Jesus do? Jesus responds. He doesn't react. Puts ears on, goes with them willingly, has some conversation. I agree with Paul when he says, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. In other words, we have tremendous amount of freedom to use our words in any way we want. But restraint, restraint is a part, and should be a part of the believer's um, DNA. Once again, Jesus shows restraint. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot call my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? I don't know about you, but I would have liked Jesus with a little less restraint. I would have liked to have seen 12 angels, 12 legions of angels come out of nowhere and beat the tar out of everybody. I would have liked that. It would have been tremendous. That's right. That's correct. And that's why restraint was key. And I say that we have, some, to some degree, not history changing, maybe personal history, but our restraint can keep things from getting out of control or from plans going awry, right? That it should go a certain way. So Jesus shows restraint, Peter does not. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Restraint. Jesus could have obliterated these dudes and did on a regular basis out in the field, right? They're questioning him, lawyers, what's the greatest commandment, all this stuff. And he taught, and he taught, and he taught. Now he's here, and he's going, no, nope, lesson's over, guys. Done. I'm done talking to you about this. You want to charge me? Great. The Bible says, right, that, that prophetically, that like he was a lamb led to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth, right? He's saying, yeah, don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to open your mouth if you have the high ground, right? Not responding can be more powerful than responding. Silence. I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to give in to that. Because how many of you know the devil would love to trip you up in your words, to say something you should not say, to hurt somebody, to distance yourself from somebody. Restraint will reward you. This is a little op-ed piece. Anybody know Patty? You don't know who Patty Reagan. Patty Reagan is the daughter of Ronald Reagan. You guys remember who Ronald Reagan is? He's a president. And so uh, Prince Harry, by the way, wrote a tell-all book. I don't know if anybody reads that stuff. I don't. But he does a tell-all book and says, it's called uh, Spare. And he says, says, silence gives you room. This is what Patty says to Prince Harry. Silence gives you room. It gives you distance and lets you look at your experiences more completely without the temptation to even the score. Sometimes in the years ahead, Harry may look back as I did and wish he could unspeak what he said. I've learned something else about truth. Not every truth has to be told to the entire world. People are always going to be curious about famous families, and often the stories from those families can resonate with others, give them insight into their own situations, even transcend time, since fame flutters at the ages of, uh, edges of eternity. But not, every, but not everything needs to be shared, a truth that silence can teach. Harry seems to have operated on the dictum that silence is not an option. I would respectfully suggest to him that it is. One rule you will learn as a youth pastor is you don't share everything about your life, right? Because what happens is if a pastor told you, if a pastor comes up to you and says, hey, listen, I know how you feel, you know, I'm struggling with porn too. Well, what? <laughs> right, like right now? <laughs> like, you're, like right now you're struggling with it? We don't share everything. It doesn't, it doesn't help the relationship. You don't share anything with a student because you don't want students to know, first of all, all your business, stuff that you should be bringing before God, 
you don't need to bring to everybody else. You, are you with me on that? So restraint and even the sense of your story, it's your story to tell when you want to tell it, not when other people ask you to tell it, not when other people provoke you to tell it. Your stuff is your stuff. That time will come or it will never come. Some things maybe should never see the light of day. There are things that will probably never come out of my mouth about my past because A, it's nobody's business and B, it's not helpful. It's not going to help you by me telling you that. And it diminishes, diminishes the, I don't want to diminish the confidence of my students to be able to, to look and say, and I'm not being a liar, I'm just saying, look, I don't need to share all that. I don't need to be on that level. I don't need to be on a 14-year-old's level in regards to shared experience because it's not the same. So I make sure that when I'm talking with students and people in general, I have to say, I'm probably not going to, in my head I'm going, well, should I share that? No, nah, I probably won't. Probably don't need to say that. Right? So I'm going to do uh, a thing for you. I am what is called a, uh, a referee, a certified three practices referee. Okay? Which means I conduct conversations that do not, that, that emphasize restraint. Sometimes you don't want to get into a conversation because you feel like an argument is going to happen. You can feel it in the room. It starts to bubble up. Somebody's going to say something. They're going to say this. I'm going to say that. So it's threepractices.com. If anybody's interested, you can, by subject, if you look it up, you can find by, so there are questions. There's what's called framing questions. So if you want to sit in on a discussion and kind of follow with what the rules are, which is what I'm going to do with you right now, uh, you can do that. So here's what I'm going to do. An exercise in restraint, three practices. So here's the deal. The three rules are this. I will be unusually interested in others. I will stay in the room with difference. I'll stop comparing my best with your worst. So we're going to have what I, what I would call a controlled conversation where the point of this will be discovery. We're going to learn something about how people feel about a particular subject or whatever it may be. So I'm going to put two questions up here, and I'm going to read you then. I'm going to read you the, kind of the rules, if you will, okay? Um, the two questions are this. I'll let you choose which one of those questions you'd like to do. First one is, if it turned out that being good was more important than being right, what would that do to social media? Second question, if the old saying is true that people don't remember what you told them, they remember how you made them feel, how are you doing as a persuader? Now, which of those questions do you think we should tackle? Second. Who says first? Who says second? Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring up my script here. I'm going to read it to you. And what I'm going to do is from where you're at, you're not going to have to get up. You're going to stay where you're seated. Okay. <clears throat> and I will read, I will read the, uh, the rules to you. Okay. As to what you're going to do. Because this is what I would do in a, an actual scenario. Um, Oh, let's see if that, let me see if I put it up here already. Okay. So we'll do a discovery circle. Let me bring this up. Okay. So I'm going to read just the referee, the, the referee part here, okay? So our, re our framing question is, and I'll bring it back up here in a minute, says, this circle will help us gain clarity about the value of people whose opinions, beliefs, or lived experience is different than my own. A volunteer will respond to the framing question for up to two minutes. So in other words, I will have my clock out. If somebody wants to respond, you say, I would like to address that. I will put two minutes on the clock, and you will have two minutes to share whatever it is you want to share about that topic. Okay? Following that, anyone that may ask a clarifying question, okay? For the record, that's the most, in other words, for the record, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard is not a clarifying question. The most important rule is that each clarifying question must begin with the phrase, I'd be curious to know. That's how you will frame your question. And if you don't frame it that way, I as the referee will tell you, could you do a better job at maybe asking the question? Could you start it with, I'd be curious to know? Sounds like how a presidential debate is supposed to be. Oh, right? uh, yeah, right, maybe, right? Uh, so, um, okay, the most important, it says, just for practice, just for practice, uh, please, well, this is on Zoom, so unmute yourself. So, uh, unmute yourself, and on the count of three, I say, I'd be curious to know with me. Ready? One, two, three. I'd be curious to know. 
For example, it's fair to ask a question like, I'd be curious to know how you think that sounds to a woman, a person of color, an immigrant, or whatever fits, as long as it's genuinely curious and gets straight to the point. A big part of my job is helping you work on that skill so that I may lend a hand if you have trouble finding your question. Following each clarifying question, the volunteer has up to one minute to respond. Okay? You may ask one follow-up question if you wish. You can tell I'm the head referee because I have the clock. The clock is not about power. It's about fair play. It's to help you keep track of time. And when your two minutes is up, let me know. If you, can, if you can't see the clock, I'll adjust it. Don't be surprised by periods of silence. We'll sit with it when we are, when, while we wait for people to find their voice or their question. When you're ready to ask the question, raise your hand so I can see you if you know, and then we go into Zoom. One more thing, when I say thank you, that mean, what that really means is please stop talking. Let me repeat that. When I say thank you, that really means I'm saying time's up, please stop. Uh, I'll explain a few other rules as we go along, but that's enough for now. So I will go back to the question here. I will go back to the question here and we'll just take, okay. So the question we are, uh, I'll reread the framing question. If the old saying is true that people don't remember what you told them, they remember how you made them feel, how are you doing as a persuader? Now let me get my clock ready. How are you doing at persuading people? In other words, are you, uh, are you saying, uh, are you more, uh, how are you doing at making people feel? How are you doing at leaving people feeling better than just, um, you know, uh, about the facts you want to tell them? Okay. How are you doing at that? Okay. People don't remember what you told them. They remember how you made them feel. How are you doing as a persuader? Would anybody like to take two minutes? talk about this subject. The argument is, it's not an argument. Oh. It's your, all you're doing is taking two minutes to talk about this topic. It could be a personal experience. It could be a time when somebody did not make you feel good. That they were just interested in facts and they just wanted to point fingers or whatever they wanted to do. They really weren't interested in that. Maybe you want to talk about the concept itself and think, well, I think the concept is dumb. You could talk about that. You have two minutes to talk about anything within the context of this question. Who would like to take two minutes if they have an opinion about that? Not an opinion, but a, something you'd like to say about it. Okay? Your two minutes starts now. Um, so I've experienced back home when I was a youth leader in a youth group, um, there was a student whose father died and he was really struggling with um, why God would let that happen and some of the truth behind that and just why there was so much struggle in his life. So I, um, I ended up spending a lot of time with him. We would get together and we would do little Bible studies and stuff and just dive into some truth, which was really cool. And we had a lot of fun and he had a lot of questions. And it also just kind of got him out of his house, got him out of where he was used to seeing his dad every day. And gave him an opportunity to just kind of um, be his own person and see the perspective of the world through his own eyes instead of through the mourning and um, sadness that he was experiencing in his life that was kind of really, really dragging him down. He was about 16, 17, so he was uh, in high school. We used to go fishing a lot. We had a lot of fun um, getting into some crazy topics. We talked a lot on kind of identity and what that looks like in that. But something I noticed is um, in our relationship and in hanging out, he didn't always take a lot. He didn't always take a lot out of like the truths, truths we were talking about, the scripture we were talking about. But he was really enjoying the um, the time of just kind of freedom, the time where he could just let the the sorrow in his mind just kind of go to the back, or just kind of walk through it and live live life of his own two feet and not be just weighed down by that burden. And it was cool to be able to see him work through that in that timing and work through that with the truth of the Lord um, at the, the fundamental state. Okay. Uh, I'd be curious to know, how do you think that made him feel? Your approach. Loved. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Would anybody like to take their two minutes? I have a question. Um, I'd like to know. Well, 
I'd be curious to. What effect that had on your life and what you specifically heard about that? So this was, um, I, I've talked to a lot of you about this, but I, when I was a firefighter, I saw a lot of death, and it took me a little bit to kind of figure out how to approach that in life. So I feel like in the, in the U.S. specifically, I think we're pretty guarded from death. I think that's something we don't experience very often, and the, the first few times that I was witnessing people die, it's pretty catastrophic because a lot of those people that were dying were not bearing the fruit of Christ, and obviously their eternity, um, only the Lord knows, but it seemed like it was not going down the path that eternity was wanted. So, um, and I don't fully know the state of where his dad was at in that, but in my own life, I definitely experienced some of the stress of like, man, I wonder if I could have said something different. I wonder if I could have help this person more in their last moment to be able to do that. And it's a very self-destructive um, type of mindset that can uh, definitely not help. So in talking to him, that was part of, um, I, I found in my own life that we can only do what the Lord equips us to do, and he uses us in the way that he wants to. And we, need, we need to be careful to keep walking in his will and not get caught in the lull of the stress of things that we don't have control over. And that was a lot of what we talked about when I was spending time with him is, this was not something he could have controlled. This was a utter accident that nothing could have changed and that the Lord uses things like that to work in people's lives around, around him. Any clarifying questions? Okay. Any other questions? I take two minutes. You may take your two minutes. I will start right now. So a similar story in my life. Um, I was on a Christian retreat very intense, very focused, and at dinner time, my sister was on staff, she happened to be on staff, she came up to me and said, hey, I need to let you know that our grandma passed away um, this afternoon after walking, and it was peaceful, and, um, but you need to know that, and so, you know, I was like, great, <laughs> I'm going to retreat. Um, I wasn't super close with this grandma personally, like, I never had a, like, I, we did a lot together when I was a kid, like playing games and such, but not like an adult relationship. And so I didn't know how to process that during dinner time in the middle of retreat. And then later the night, that night, we went to a chapel service. And I didn't expect to be affected by it, honestly. And then I just kind of fell apart completely. And I had a lady that had literally met me that weekend. We had talked about like nothing almost. Um, and she just stuck with me that night and her arms around me and then let me cry. And that was like the best thing she could have done. Like, it just made me feel very, uh, like he said, like loved, um, secured, supported. Um, not, you know, I was sitting in the front row of like 40 people bawling, so I didn't feel so much as uncomfortable as I would have felt doing that. Okay. Any questions? I'd be curious to know, have you had that experience with somebody else? Did you, have you ever done something what that woman did for you? Have you done that for somebody else? In a different situation, yes. Yeah. I would be curious to know, are you okay with sharing that or is it more private? What happened here, so. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Any other questions? Does anybody want to take two minutes? Yes, a question or two minutes? Two minutes. <clears throat> uh, I'm just thinking that the, the people don't remember uh, what you told them, they remember how you make them feel. That may be true in some situations, but I feel like when people, especially when they get defensive, they like to choose to pick apart your words instead of focus on uh, that. So that's kind of my... Okay. Does anybody have a question? I'd be curious to know what type of language you mean. What type of language are you? Yeah, like what, what, what do you mean by what words people use in that context? Uh, well, I just mean when people start getting defensive about any subject you're talking about, they like to pick apart your words and the aspect of 
you, uh... They, they don't tend to look at, like, the overall of what you're trying to say. They like to look very narrowly at any mistakes you might be making in your, you know, wording or stuff like that. I'd be curious to know if you have any examples that you'd be willing to share. I do not have any examples on top of my head. Okay. Any other questions? Do you want to have a negative scenario? <laughs> this is positivity lesson. Well, well, not actually. If, if you want to share, if you want to take your two minutes to talk about something that's like, hey, that's perfectly okay. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that because the two minutes is your two minutes to say anything you want. That's your two minutes. There's no judgment on that. We get to ask questions, though. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, you have a follow-up. You have a follow-up yeah, question. Follow go ahead. Okay, sorry. It's all right. Um, I'd be curious as if that was you made them feel a certain way. Would that be the same as going back to the feelings? They remember how you made them feel, so that's why they attack you with those words. So by speaking down those words, that's why they remember those words because you, they remember that feeling that those words brought. Um. I would, I would know, yeah, I, th I think that uh, they might remember what you said, like, in the moment, that's what triggered it, but I don't know if that's what they remember long term. Any other questions? I'd be curious to know, have you ever done this to somebody else? Done. Have you ever... Uh, picked apart anybody else's words. Yes. I'd be curious to know, how do you think that made them feel? Um, uh, they typically get very frustrated in that they feel like they can't express without being extremely cautious in the vocabulary and the words they use. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Do you see the value of what we've done this moment? What is the value? Did anybody fight? No. Did anybody argue? No. Did we find out some things? We did. What were you going to say? Okay. Curiosity is, is well, it killed the cat, but it, also, <laughs> but it also got more answers than the cat attacking the person, right? Uh, the fact is this, if you're going to engage in conversations of topics, come from a place of curiosity, not facts, not, not I have something I want to tell you that I know. You're trying to find out it's respect to the person because you may not know where they've come from. You may not know that they've been attacked in a certain way. You may not know that they're covering up because they've had this line of questioning before. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So my encouragement is, is that you, know, you don't have to set up a big thing like this, but coming from a place of curiosity and coming to a place where you're asking questions versus making assertions will certainly benefit you in the long run. Any questions about the process we just had? Any debrief? Oh, I forgot one last thing. You're welcome to say, anybody can participate, you're welcome to say, for our experience, you're welcome to say thank you to anybody that you would like to thank because maybe you heard somebody say something that you thought they did a really good job with. So I want to offer you an opportunity, a quick one minute round of would you like to say thank you to anybody and why? Yes. Okay. Anybody else have a thank you? Thank you to you for clarifying, like, uh, kind of what Colby was saying. <laughs> okay. Any other thank yous? Thank you, Lexi, for talking about the hardships that you've done. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Colby, for 
your honesty and just uh, bringing out, you know, being, being stepping up and, and uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, when we are sharing things, right? I think you did a very good job of articulating, you know, what you felt about it. And, uh, and sometimes that's not easy to do that uh, in front of people. So I thought you did a very good, very good job at that. Anything else? All right. Well, you're done. Enjoy your afternoon and enjoy lunch. We'll see you down there. If you have questions, let me know.